Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to OpenShift TV. We are joined today for the Ask the Product Manager show by the one and only Michael Barrett. Michael Barrett is the Senior Director of Product Management for OpenShift. He answers to all masters, right? Like he has to keep the customers happy, he has to keep the business happy, and he has one of the hardest jobs here at Red Hat, I feel like. Mike, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So like Chris said, I'm the Senior Director of Product Management. Um, I've been with OpenShift since the, you know, the 2.0 release, so uh, for quite some time, going on seven years. Um, I do have the fortunate experience of being kind of the blend between customer escalations, between the product direction, between, you know, revenue facing obligations. Uh, it all mixes together kind of yeah. at, at my level. So it's, um, it's a great job. It's a great place to be. I love being a product manager. I love that discipline. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just a fantastic um, situation for me. Um, how I, I got into it is, is even more uh, fortunate. So I started my career at Sun Microsystems. Oh, wow. Okay. In the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went into Sun, I went in as tech support. So answering the cool. phone, 1 800 USA for Sun, answering all, all over the planet, questions wow. coming in. And uh, at that, it was the internet boom, right? The dot com was about to burst. It was around the end of that era and i was taking like 50 to 75 calls a day like it was like wow. hang up the phone pick up another one right wow. and um you know doing that for a couple of years you start to realize well what's the bigger picture like mm -hmm. why why does the product even exist and why does it have those features and how did those features get into the product and you start growing and, and picking up more and more. And that's when I started to get into fly and fix and, you know, doing some sort of uh, sustaining work a little bit. And then I went into product management after that. Nice. And, um, but I was always attracted to resource management on the operating system. I was attracted okay. to um, like, we, we called LDOMs back then and Slayer yeah. Zones. Yep. Yep. Before Slayer Zones, they were called L nodes. Um, so that area, I, I just I haven't I managed a Solaris zone enough forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it changed my life the first time I saw that, you know, yeah, because it another operating system within the same kernel almost. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, whoa, the stuff you can do. So then I, you know, I started pushing those technologies pretty aggressively and I went out and I flipped the world to Slayer Zones, right? It was a strategy that, that Sun at the time was doing away from LDOMs, away from hardware hypervisors. Yeah. Um, and then after a right before the Oracle acquisition, I went and switched them all back to LDOMs because, <laughs> because we were trying to like save the company and make money and Spark yeah. was more expensive and mm. that was a higher profit margin and we never really got the um you know the uh, the the community around open solaris that say yeah. linux had on yeah, the x86 yeah, yeah. platform mm. so it's uh it was weird it was weird switching forward and backwards and then i went to oracle from the acquisition and they're like well you know a lot about zones and ldoms and infrastructure virtualization why don't you accelerate oracle applications with those technologies and uh that sounds a heck of a lot like a, a PaaS at the time. Yeah. And so we yeah. started getting like before more... the PaaS days though, right? Like way yeah. before. Yeah. So we start getting the PaaS, you know, do that for a couple of years. You start um, looking at, hey, Heroku and all these other competitors. And that's when I was researching a competitor and found OpenShift. And wow. I went to the OpenShift website and I was able to get a login and a password and deploy an app within like, a couple of minutes and i was like holy <laughs> what version I, of openshift was that just out of curiosity because i was kind of the same way i think it was with version two yeah it, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah and yeah, then that's... uh yeah and then i'm like well i gotta get out of here because i gotta get over there because i <laughs> that makes a lot more sense to me that's um, awesome so then i switched companies and i've been doing this yeah. And we're so happy to have you here. Seriously, not just on the show, but like at the company in general, right? Like you bring a wealth of knowledge and just industry experience that it's rather intensive and in deep, especially in this 
like, you know, OpenShift realm or Kubernetes realm that we're living in now. Uh, yeah. I say realm because, you know, Solaris zones are still out there somewhere. You know, there's still LXD and LXC containers out there still. You know, there, there's, there's containers that have been around a long time, but the container yeah. orchestrator du jour seems to be Kubernetes and OpenShift is our Kubernetes distribution. So, uh, I, you know, having you on means a lot to me. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, pleasure to be um, here. So, yeah, you're you decided the topic today, which I thought was brilliant, right? Like, what are the top five bugs we've had this month, right? Like, this is a brilliant idea, and like, going forward, I would like to see more stuff like this, right? Like, let's help our customers directly, right? Like, let's use the data we have as as OpenShift as Red Hat, the company, and let's use this channel as a medium to deliver those hot fixes, those quick fixes for those customer problems. So I'd love for you to dive right into what you got going here. Yeah, I love it. So let's uh, kick it off. Um, you know, before I get into the bugs, I think it's important to know what we're working on in general and how the bugs fit in. And yeah. then I'm, I'm going to talk about how a bug even gets fixed and, you know, what releases is that possible to get a fix on. Um, so there's a lot going on in the next two years. And yeah. this... <laughs> This slide is is all over the place, but if you if you start from the bottom and go up, just really really briefly, you know the the world wants to blend public providers with on premises experiences. Like you yeah. see it with Tanzu, you see it with um, IBM Cloud Satellite, you see it with um, Outpost, with Azure Arc. Outpost, yeah, all those fun little. I, uh, yeah, Gartner so, came up with a term for him, but I forget what it was. But it was something like. It wasn't called like hybrid cloud. They they made it very, very big and long. So yeah, yeah we'll see what <laughs> that turns out to be. <laughs> yeah. So OpenShift has to work in all those. And um, we're working aggressively, obviously, with the IBM Cloud Satellite, but we're also working very aggressively with Azure Arc. You saw that at, at Summit, the demo uh, yeah. with Microsoft. Um, so those are the, the two hot irons uh, in the fire right now, but all of them have to reconcile with us in, in how we do networking and how we uh, fit into their, their larger scheme. So, you know, most of them are, are running an agent. Um, you know, agent is a bad word now, you call them a pod, right? On, on, on your cluster. And then once that pod is in your cluster, you can incorporate it into that larger solution. Uh, so, so you see a lot of work going on there. The next step up, you see a ton of work going on what we call KNI, Kubernetes Native Infrastructure, right? And this is pushing Kubernetes primitives, how you explain, how you um, write your pod specs, how you query the kubectl minus C apply YAML file, making sure you can do that to infrastructure components now, bring on a bare metal server, do those types of interesting things. And that's where you see us doing kubevert, you see us um, doing CATA containers, you see us doing some bare metal, metal cube is the project upstream. Uh, you see us getting into high performance networking more so than we ever have with SROV and offloading. So a lot of cool stuff there. The next one up is, um, you know, customers have come to us now that we're, we're a couple of years in on being sort of this agnostic layer that you run everywhere on, on all the public clouds. Mm -hmm. um, they're starting to realize, well, hey, I actually like maybe how they do permissions on AWS. And maybe I don't want that to be agnostic. Maybe I actually want to dig in a little more aggressively to what AWS does there. <clears throat> and so that's, um, that's what we're going back now. And we're adding some of those opportunities. So if you wanted to dive deeply into AIM roles and have that integration expose you to that to, in the OpenShift process, we're going to add that this year to it and we'll do it for Google and we'll do it for um, Azure after that. So you, you see us having the agnostic abilities, but also where you have demanded it, we'll start exposing you more to those underlying platforms. Right. And that gets into routing and load balancing and all, all that all fun the stuff. Fun networking stuff. Yeah. Um, lots of really cool stuff going on around the scheduler, around how you evict workloads, around how you balance and rebalance a distributed system. So a lot of theory coming to actual mm -hmm. code there. Uh, C groups version two is pretty exciting. That's coming out. KMS yeah, is huge. fine. Yeah. yeah. KMS is finally getting some legs. So we're going to do some vault integrations this year with that. Nice. Um, the next layer up, a lot of serverless, a lot of event-based um, API platforms, right? And how the gateway now facilitates an easier flow with your serverless topologies. So a lot of cool stuff there. 
on top of that, you have layer seven, right? The um, what you used to buy your hard your uh, firewall appliances are now mm-hmm. baked into Envoy, and you have this Istio control plane, and now people want to do more with that in their applications. So you, you yeah. see that coming. Um, then we have this blows my mind. I have a lot of um, maybe they're on the on the phone today. A lot of customers are starting to move away from say HTTP and moving to gRPC, yeah. and um, that is just mind blowing uh, to to go through that that translation because you know what they're noticing is you take the JVM and it's got all these modules around it that make right. it fatter and fatter and fatter logging monitoring how it does process handling. Um, you don't need any of those if you've agreed that your platform is Kubernetes, right? If you've, if you've made that mental choice that I'm going to run these apps on Kubernetes, you can replace some of those components of the JVM with the Kubernetes services. Yeah. And when you move to gRPC, you're doing that with a lot of really lightweight Javas. And uh, that's really speeding up uh, a lot of um, applications. Um, on the side, there's even exciting stuff going on, right? We have um, GitOps and the pipelines and Argo CD and declarative management at all layers of the stack instead of issuing commands, just putting right. another config. Uh, yeah, file like, place. like kubectl and OC are going to become like the SSH, right? Like if yeah. you have to use that, there's a problem kind of scenario is where we're trying to take the platform with GitOps and, you know, our teams teaming up with all the uh, GitOps platforms of the world. So you can agnostically choose which way you want to get ops, you know? Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And then the last one is the autonomous platform. So the, um, you know, we've gone through a lot of uh, engineering work to connect the open shore for platform should you allow it to be connected it's still up to you back to us and then applying what we call insights to the telemetry that we're seeing and it's um it's been really been remarkable um even the even the customers that don't know that they're helping are helping because when an engineer sees error messages and events, and now all the engineering scrum teams, part of their sprint process is looking at telemetry and deciding whether or not the application is behaving as they coded it. That's right. a, it's a fundamental shift that's part of their sprint process now. And um, we generate probably on any given, um, I'd say release, which is a three month period, we'll generate probably 15 to 20 fixes in the product that no customer even called on just right. from the, just, just because we're, they're sharing data with us. Right. And it's a minimal amount of data at that, yeah. that they're sharing, but we're able to do a lot with it, which is why we encourage people to turn on telemetry because we can forecast problems before they ever become a problem to an extent. Right. That's it. So that's really exciting. So that you know, that's a lot of work, and that's happening in the next uh, two years. There, um, let's talk about patching. So when you get OpenShift and you decide to buy OpenShift, you're buying a support contract in mm-hmm. reality, right? You could have gotten the software; it's open source from OKD or from uh, the Kubernetes upstream. Mm-hmm. So what you're really interested in is support, life cycling, fixes, things of that nature. So right now, if you're one of our customers, you would have OpenShift 3.11, which was our last release in the 3.x life. And that you can get fixes, actual binary fixes for until June of 2022. Nice. So, so it'll be fully supported until June of next year, 2021. And then we'll do CVE and security fixes until June of 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll actually answer the phone and help you with it and point out existing articles and do that kind of stuff without yeah. giving you a fix until 2024. So Dang. that's what we'll do for the last version of a, of a major release. Yeah. I mean, but when you think about that, right, like we're taking Kubernetes 111 and supporting it all the way until 2022. No one saw that coming when they made Kubernetes 111, right? Like no one said, oh yeah, someone's going to run this, be running this in 2022, right? Like the intention is for everybody to update every release, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And we know that as an enterprise software customer, that that those releases sometimes take time and you have interdependencies that rely upon that. And we believe in supporting what we create. I mean, it's a great, it's a great place to be as far as, you know, a company ethos, right? So it is. 
And it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard yeah, to it's, pull that it's off. It's hard to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I talked to a, a couple of um, uh, competing platforms out there in the market because I'm interested just how, how they pull this off because mm-hmm. it's, um, it's, it's, you know, for, so for most of my career, I worked in a proprietary environment and then I went to Red Hat and it switched to being purely open source. And as a product manager, it, um, it, it, it's hard to get used to because you can't get, you can't snap your fingers and get a feature. The feature right. has to go through the upstream. People have to agree that the feature is needed. They have to agree how it's going to be coded. So it adds some additional time there, but then you can't just fix things either. You have to put them back in the upstream or else you're going to mm-hmm. fork yourself. Mm-hmm. And, um, so you, you ask a lot of competitors how they're doing it in small startups and a lot of them are just downloading the binaries and downloading whatever is the current release in the upstream. They're not, they, they're not carrying enough staff and enough expertise and enough people in the SIGs where they can actually put code back and fix things at a support obligation. Right. And um, so it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. And we put a lot of time and effort and energy into it. And if you look at Red Hat's engagement across the Kubernetes community, we're deeply involved, right? Like uh, to to say that folks on this call aren't working on Kubernetes would be very false, right? Like uh, I work on the community Kubernetes side of things. You have to touch the Kubernetes side of things quite often. And when I say the Kubernetes side of things, I mean like, github.com slash kubernetes right <laughs> like, yep. that's what i mean when i say kubernetes right like that organizational structure is you know in and of itself something that you have to work with and is very much structured and a way to you know inject work and remove work that kind of thing yep and then that brings the 4.x and right now um there's three versions of 4.x and that falls in line with this link at the bottom of the slide if you want to click on it in your free time that's the upstream um, compatibility and upstream carries three versions of Kubernetes as well right. at any, at any time. Mm-hmm. So we're supporting uh, 4.5 is the current release. And then it's a, it's a N minus two. So you have 4.5, 4.4 and 4.3 getting support. So there's, there's four code branches that our engineers are maintaining right now. The 3.11 code branch, the 3.4, the 4.4 and the 4.5. Right. Now, when 4.6 comes out in a couple of weeks in October, it'll pop out 4.3, and then it'll be 4.6, 4.5, and 4.4 that's going to be supported. And why do we um, think we can do that? Why do we think customers can upgrade that fast, right? Yeah. Like, it's, if, we've done a lot to make that possible, right? Like, Yeah. We, I mean, a it, lot. <laughs> it, it, it started... Um, and, and look, it, it wasn't all altruistic, right? When we, no. in, in 2017, when we realized the world was moving to Kubernetes because we were being so successful with it, we knew that the cloud providers were going to start offering it, right? And mm-hmm. it, if the cloud provider is offering your software like that without anybody touching anything, then you have to make your life cycle of your software extraordinarily easy. Mm-hmm. Like it has to be super easy. Right. And so, and that was the engineering task, right? To, to not only fix all the problems that we, we learned about operating systems being out of sync with platforms and how infrastructure could hurt a platform. Uh, we were solving that too, but we also wanted to make sure that anybody could upgrade at a very consistent pace and stay innovative with the Kubernetes release cycles. So um, yeah, a lot of work there. Um, I, I will say this, on 4.6, you see it supported all the way out to May of 2022, and that's because 4.6 is going to be our extended release um, Interesting version there. So, yeah, how involved have you been in the Kubernetes LTS discussion? Uh, I ask because I think it was, what was it, whenever we were in Seattle for KubeCon, 2018, 2017, I forget, um, but yeah, like the LTS discussion was like a birds of a feather discussion that I just started and decided, hey, I'll help moderate this. And it was mo- the most liveliest discussion I've ever had in the Kubernetes community, a long term supported version and yeah. what that would take. Right. Like because people immediately looked at me and said it would take Red Hat. <laughs> it would take something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I have been uh, listening over the shoulders of people, and um, I'm happy that 
Upstream decided to go for a year for the yeah. 119. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great move. I, I'm, I'm happy that they decided to, to do that. Yeah, it's it's going to be iterative, but the you know like Kubernetes itself is learning that these support cycles have to be longer. Yeah. So we've we've gone into that with that mantra. So yeah, we're we're helping Kubernetes and you know through our own con contributors manage that. Yeah. So you notice on the last slide, there's four months. There's a four month gap there between mm. a Kubernetes release and the OpenShift release. And what are we doing? Well, we're we're going through our internal processes, right? We we're contributing and we're taking part. We have tons of engineers and all the SIGs upstream, but when we decide to downstream something, it's got to work in our ecosystem with our ISV partners, with our internal other engineering teams within Red Hat. And that obviously will find bugs, find more issues that were in that Kubernetes upstream. So we're, we're fixing around a hundred in that gap. Um, and we're running through the certification processes that we have to do internally to, to downstream software. Mm -hmm. And those certification processes are dictated somewhat by CNCF, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and, we are a certified Kubernetes distribution by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, right? Like we cannot lose sight of that fact, right? Like yeah. we are Kubernetes. It's not some fork. It's not something Kubernetes is underneath and we've built stuff on top. Right, yeah. like we built stuff around it, inside of it, on top of it to make it enterprise ready. And sorry, I just bumped my mic. My bad. <laughs> yeah, and and we go through a lot of um, sort of internal soul searching to make sure that we're not in disagreement with the upstream. Like we've, and that's been hard. Yeah, yeah. that's been difficult because mm -hmm. you know some of the upstream may only have a cloud provider point of view, and mm -hmm. they could care less about something that's happening on premises with like down at the, the low, super low level storage right, or super right, low right. level uh, networking. So it's hard to, to push some of those things at times, uh, but we've always tried to stay consistent with um, whatever the larger community has, has decided. Um, we're not by ourselves by any means by staying one release behind. You'll notice across the board that most people will stay one release behind. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, I mean, looking at this, the only one that's consistently doing it at the exact same time would be the IBM um, Kubernetes service, the IKS is right. sometimes yeah. known as. Yeah. So that is that. Um, it's good to know what we're going through because when you open up bugs, and by the way, uh, anybody can open up an account on Bugzilla dot red hat com so mm -hmm. you can do that today and then on issues at red hat com in the month of october you'll see us putting more and more open shift content that's our jira out on um issues at red hat com so you'll nice. see a mix between jira and bugzilla there um why this is important is because you'll be interacting with us over at bugzilla and you'll be saying you know wh why the heck isn't that engineer paying attention to me right now um why can't I get his or her attention? And sometimes they're just trying to close something in their process. So if you look at a given release of OpenShift, we have around four to five sprints and a sprint is three weeks long. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, just like everybody else's agile process, we have a, a grooming week, we'll have a burn down week and we'll have a, an innovation or a code week in that uh, sprint process, we'll do that five times. Um, at the beginning, we're obviously going to pick a Kubernetes release that we're going to be based on, right? So 4.6 is based on Kubernetes 1.19. Uh, so that means we're rebasing our OpenShift to that 1.19 um, core, if you will. And, and I'm sure oh. nothing will break in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's so many API changes every release. Yep. <laughs> so that's what we're going through. The, the, the rebase is obviously the first thing to do. Um, then we start coding, right? And we'll code all the way for like three sprints all the way to feature complete. And that's that beginning of that yellow um, line there. After feature complete, we, we tell the engineers, hey, you got to get this feature to actually work. <laughs> like they're, they're, they're integrating it back to trunk. They're going through unit testing. Mm -hmm. They're going through their, their process. And now it's time to hone down and make that thing rock solid and to look at all the other bugs that have been created because of the new code and to start burning down those bugs to get ready for the code freeze, right? Um, 
right in that yellow slot is when we'll start planning the next release. <clears throat> yep. So right after they go into feature complete, we'll start thinking about the next release as they're running down and getting the code to, to work extremely well. And then we'll go into a uh, code freeze. Along this line, you'll pick, you can, as a user, go to our nightly site and download OpenShift nightlies. And starting right after that first rebase, you would be on the actual next release of the product if you wanted to start experiencing it super early. So mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to look at that next release in our nightly drops. Um, then we go through a, a GA process and then we um, push it out. So let's look at what it means to fix one of these bugs. Um, so we're in oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> so we're, we're in September. Um, if you look at Kubernetes, we'll release a 1.19.2 patch set in September. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously the next release of Kubernetes, which has a branch and has code going into it. We'll release in October 4.6, which is going to be based on Kubernetes 1.19. And then in November, we'll you know, it's the end of October for 4.6. So at the beginning of November, you'll see the first nightly, which is OKV, um, drop for 4.7, which will be based on Kubernetes 1.20. And then we go into December. But what if we hit a bug at the end of November? So it's a customer using 4.6, and they might even be using 4.5 or 4.4 at that point. Right. Uh, but they, they hit a bug. Um, we have to immediately look at the bug and see if it's in the existing branch that hasn't released yet in Kubernetes. So that'd mm -hmm. be Kubernetes 1.20 at that right. point. Upstream, yeah. Upstream. Yeah. We have to fix it in Kubernetes 1.20. And then we have to cherry pick that fix back to the version of Kubernetes that we're on, which is at that point, Kubernetes 1.19.2. Mm -hmm. And then we have to decide whether or not Kubernetes is going to let us fix that in the backported version. Like if we're going back to 4.4 or if we're going back to 3.11, sometimes the upstream won't backport stuff to those older releases if it's outside their policy. And so we would be carrying that code in OKD for the, for the backport. But nothing starts unless it's fixed in the upstream, if it's fixed in the current code base. And that, that's what keeps us not forking because as long as we're, we're always putting back to the code base, the upstream, then we're in the same code stream. Um, so th that's when we cherry picked it back to 4.6. Um, then we have to downstream that, you know, Kubernetes 1.19.2, right? Has to get mm -hmm. downstreamed into OpenShift's GitHub, which is our downstream. And then every week we put out a ZStream now for the 4.x. So literally every week we're putting out code fixes to OpenShift through Bugs, that. Anything, you name it. It's just all getting rolled out. Yep. yep. Once and the that, feature complete, here you go. Yep. And that's that over the air update process, right? That's the thing right. that you had, uh, I think Rob Zumski and Scott mm -hmm. Dotson on. So that's that machine that we have to, to push out those fixes in a, in a pretty rapid area. Um, I will say right before we release a GA, we'll turn on our hosted services on that release. So right now we're working on 4.6. Uh, we're working with our OpenShift dedicated hosted service, our SRE group, uh, to start using OpenShift 4.6 before we GA it. So we'll, we'll do that uh, across all the releases. Some cool links at the bottom that talks about the Kubernetes patch releases if you want to see where the patch sets are coming and then how you can contribute to those. So let's get into the bugs after now we understand the backdrop, right? You understand what we're working on long term in general, how we have our releases, um, you know, how we introduce patches. Uh, before I get into the bugs, did you see any chat questions? I haven't been looking. Um, so the the nightlies versus canary releases right like is there any correlation between the kubernetes kind of nightly builds versus our nightly builds i mean obviously we're not getting a, stuff from upstream but is there any like direct correlation there's not a, a direct correlation um it's you know the the biggest change that i've seen is we used to have okd be something completely different than a nightly that mm. we be the OCP nightly. Right. And when we move to 4.x, both OCP and OKD are pulling from the nightlies. Yep. Uh, so the nightly almost becomes the new OKD. 
in, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but we do still, you know, pull down an OKD and make sure that you have a, a stable milestone. Because if you're just feeding from nightlies, you're feeding from some pretty crazy stuff. Like, like every night code goes into that. It could completely break the build. It could like yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do crazy stuff. So you all kinds of havoc can get let loose for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to we have to give you a milestone on OKD that's stable, and then we will continually cut ourselves out an, an OCP release uh, from that same nightly. <laughs> um, all right, the first bug. So this is a good um, reminder that some bugs are just around the complexity of all these things coming together at the same time. So a customer, a lot of them called in in September and, and said, hey, this really cool feature, this new feature that you had uh, in your logging solution, which we use Kibana and Elastic and mm -hmm. Fluentd, mm -hmm. um, we added an ability to have auditing and um, infrastructure logs like uh, from the core framework itself and application logs. And those are three index types or three things, items. Um, they noticed that if you created a user locally and you gave them cluster admin permission, that or her, that user would be able to see all three of those things. But if you added the user in an LDAP group and then came in through the LDAP group, that the person wasn't able to see the auditing and the infrastructure logs. And it was because Kubernetes has this thing called subject access reviews, uh, SARs, and mm. we were lacking this last um, group. So when you create a group that's connected to an LDAP group, you need the command has group equals test at the tail end to allow that authentication to really come together. Okay. So, you know, a lot of customers hit it. Um, it's a easy resolve. So that one's not that bad. In fact, none of these in September have been bad, um, as in like product down. Earth or shaking. Earth, yeah, earth yeah, shaking. Yeah. Um, the next one was a lot of people noticed in their error logs, uh, this, you know, Kube API firing all the time. And mm -hmm. It um, they weren't noticing anything broken in the cluster, just like these. Uh, uh, just the alert. <laughs> yeah, just and it, it's a scary alert. Um, right. And it, yeah. And, and you get tons of them. Like it's not just showing up once. It's like it's like a yeah. denial denial of service attack on you with these oh, things. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the um, they chased it down after quite a bit of time that it Looks was. Like it it was around the API server rebooting. So if your control plane rebooted and not your kubelets, or if you mm -hmm. had some network outage between the, the kubelet and the API server, they the kubelet would have a hard time renegotiating and it would throw the wrong handshake. And hmm. so a little bit of code on both sides of the, yeah, the kubelet interesting. and the server API. That's quite the bug though. I mean, that's like, to me as an ops person, right, with my ops background, if I were seeing this screaming at me every day or randomly every week or something, right, like that would freak me out. And I'm very glad we patched that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's why a lot of customers were pissed off, even though it, it wasn't um, hurting it wasn't, anything. Yeah, really. it wasn't impactful, but yeah. it was annoying, I'm sure, to a lot of customers, right? I'm sure we filled a disk on accident, maybe. Yeah. Um, this one was a, an issue on OpenShift's code base, but a good reminder to Kubernetes operators in general. So we have this thing called the mach machine config, right? And, mm -hmm. and the machine config is this really, you know, I think it's revolutionary. You, what you do is you describe how you want your operating system to look to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is putting that change down on to the operating system. Like whether yeah. you want to enable or disable SSH, you know, that, that yeah. kind of stuff. things like that, right? Like it drives all the way down to the host OS. It's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's in Kubernetes primitive. So you've right. taught Kubernetes about the infrastructure and that that's a big part of our K and I initiative, the Kubernetes native infrastructure initiative. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we forget to put a toleration on the node that when a user, because users are going to want to taint nodes for their own application purposes. They're going to want to say, hey, you know, that node, I don't want my my ERP system ever landing on that node. So I'm going right. to taint it away. Um, we didn't have a toleration where we were supposed to have it after we deployed our machine config operator daemon that lives mm. as a container. 
And so when the customer put their own taint on that particular node, it would cause our, our container to go away. Oh, and, whoops. and so machine, <laughs> machine config operator wouldn't be pushing down these the operations. Changes, yeah. And uh, you would have some nodes get out of sync because of that. So rough. Good, good fix to, to have in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Needless to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, this next bug, the um it this one was much like the other one in that it was more um it wasn't causing any outages or problems. So, you know, anytime we get bugs where it's not like my arm is broken and blood is coming out of it, but it's like my arm hurts once in a while on Tuesday and it doesn't hurt this Tuesday and I don't know why. But on Wednesday, but, my ankle hurts. Yeah. <laughs> so anything where something's not specifically broken, it, it may take a while to, to hunt down. And in this particular case, uh, we etcd was throwing these error messages, right? Yeah. And what we found was that etcd had the wrong test to determine whether or not its uh, members were healthy or not. Wow, um, that's quite the find. Yeah, so if you look through those um, etcd IO pull requests, you'll you'll go through how we want to maybe determine better before throwing in the error G uh, RPC and C no leader error. Mm -hmm. so we're we're putting in some more uh, robustness around that particular error. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, this next one took a while to figure out. At first, we thought people were putting in passwords that had characters that we didn't understand, or maybe hmm. the secret mechanism in Kubernetes was messed up. So lots of research went on, but it presented itself as, hey, I, I, you know, I'm using OpenShift on vSphere, and all of a sudden, I can't create any PVs. Like, um, my dynamic volumes aren't, aren't getting created. Uh, we do use the entry Kubernetes um, cloud provider to create storage from uh, vSphere. Mm -hmm. um, now vSphere has other opportunities, right? They have their CSI driver, which works with their vSAN product line, their additions to mm -hmm. vSphere. So we'll see the market going in that direction. But for the most part, a lot of people are still using the entry Kubernetes for their storage um, mechanism. But in this case, the secret itself um, when it changed, so when when you go and you create um, the cloud provider for vSphere, you have to tell it your vSphere username and password, and that goes in a config file, and that password becomes a secret. If you updated that file and updated the secret, this particular code on the storage side wasn't updating and seeing that the secret had changed. And so um, as you changed your password, you would find that you wouldn't be able to create uh, the storage. So that one's, um, all these are fixes in flight, uh, but those are right now in the month of September where we have the most customers uh, attached yeah, I to think them. I think that one sentence you said there, all of these fixes are fixes in flight right now. We are actively working with the various communities to get these fixes resolved and baked into OpenShift. Yep. So um, when someone someone asked in stream, are we going to code and fix these bugs in the stream or not? Well, I can show you how to fix it, but it's not going to be like something that you can then take to work with you, right? Like it's fixing underlying code and we would essentially have to fork Kubernetes and OpenShift and everything else to make that fix. It's one of those things where we have to work with the upstream communities, yeah. open source, right? Open source is all about what Red Hat is about, so and vice versa. So we have to work with the upstream communities to get these fixes into the open source products projects, so that we can put them in our closed source or not closed source, but our commercial product, yeah. right? Project so, versus product, right? We contribute to the projects so that we can build better products. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, and um, so if you're if you're a customer on OpenShift 4.5, uh, 4.4, and 4.3, you can call in and get fixes on those bugs as they're right coming now. in. Yeah, and we're in the process of going through the upstream and downstreaming, and you'll see us like maybe we'll do 4.5 first and get that mm -hmm. out, and then we'll backport to 4.4 and 4.3. So you'll you'll see us use different cadence. Sometimes uh, a, we, there literally won't even be a customer asking for it on 4.3. And so right. we won't backport it to 
Yeah. So it, it depends on, on the bug. Yep. Sure does. It really, really depends on the bug. Right. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the top five ones you mentioned are not like, they're not earth shattering, yeah. but they are definitely, you know, earth shaking to some extent. Right. Yeah, like exactly. unable to provision vSphere volume, right? Like that's supposed to be able to happen. So, you know, like that's a bug that's like one of those, wait, this is, this worked and now it doesn't kind of thing. What broke versus something where it's like spewing errors every Tuesday kind of thing randomly, depending upon which, you know, customer you are, or which, you know, yeah. setup you have, uh, that kind of thing. You bet. So question in chat here, you might be able to help with, if not, I'm sure uh, someone else might be able to help that's listening. OpenShift virtualization makes workload deployment easier for developers. Is there any performance related issues compared with the VMware environments? So this is the, the Kubert project Kubert, a, a KVM. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so like comparing OpenShift vert versus just like straight up vSphere, right? Yeah. I think you'll, you'll find that in, in most categories, they're the same and, and you don't even have to even, you know, talk about Kubert. You're, you're specifically talking about a KVM hypervisor mm. against an ESX hypervisor. Right. So if you go to the internet and you Google KVM versus ESX, you're going to find a ton of information on what's exactly the same and, and where there may be differences. Mm -hmm. Um, I know the KVM team works very aggressively to, to always close on the performance differences that they see. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm probably not the, the best expert to comment. No, on the, the but thing. I know that we do kernel tuning and everything else as part of OpenShift releases, right? Like, so that performance question is to me a good question for the channel because it's something that we definitely keep an eye on, right? Like yeah. we are aware what the customers are, what our competition is up to or what our co-opetition is up to. And, you know, we try to make things as fast as possible. We do actually do performance testing and, you know, we're in an active process of trying to get the footprint of OpenShift down. We've got it down to three node clusters now. Um, so getting, getting those problems solved also impact performance too. So like we have to continuously run performance testing against, you know, like our bug fixes and everything else. So there's yeah. a lot of work that goes involved into maintaining that, you know, kind of speed parity. But if you're trying to, you know, just run a, a VM on OpenShift, right? Like it's a pretty simple process. If you're trying to say, okay, my highly complex VM that runs on SSDs and needs, you know, 2,500, uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA cards or whatever, that might be a different story for OpenShift virtualization. But as Reese in chat just mentioned, the key thing with OpenShift Vert is that it's built on top of 10 years of experience of virtualization at Red Hat. It's built yeah. on the same technology as Red Hat virtualization and OpenStack. Remember OpenStack people? Uh, <laughs> but with OpenShift Vert, we're taught KV Kate's OpenShift how to orchestrate KVM-based VMs with libvirt and QEMU. Yeah. Uh, we're always keeping track of performance with KVM, plenty of testing, bug fixing, optimization, et cetera. There's plenty of performance testing results out there between the various platforms. So a quick Google search, you could probably find that. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, and, and then the, the bespoke workload piece, right? Like, you know, if you have OpenShift, call us up. We can work with you on that, right? Like if you're trying to get something very unique, you know, into your yeah. OpenShift cluster, we can help you. You know, it's not a big and deal. KVM in, in, in that world of hardware hypervisors and, and its derivatives are running the world's public clouds, right? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. wouldn't you wouldn't find that if it was impossible to compare it to ESX. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the fact that a lot of people are running, you know, their clouds on top of KVM versus uh vSphere is you know telling sometimes, right? Like they saw a performance reason for that. And they're running their entire cloud on top of it for that reason. So yeah, it happens. Um, but there's also the same scenario where people choose VMware and we're there to support you as well with OpenShift, right? Yeah. Like we have no qualms about where you put your VMs, right? Like, sure, we'd love you to use OpenShift virtualization, but if it's not going to work for you, we want a solution that works for you, yeah. right? We're... Like the best solution is the one that works for your company <laughs> or your organization, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that was just a comparison of uh, KVM and ESX, but we mm. we love VMware. I mean, we, we work with them aggressively um, 
just about every week you have people in your staff, Chris, that are assigned yeah. to work exact you know, very directly with a, a VMware counterpart to work on reference architectures. Um, so we're we're trying to keep both of our mutual customers extremely happy with their technologies, and we'll we'll continue to do so. Yeah, if you have virtualization questions in general, right? Like Andrew Sullivan runs a weekly or biweekly show about OpenShift administration. It's on Wednesdays. Subscribe to the calendar. I'll drop a link in chat right now to the calendar. And tune in for Andrew Sullivan's uh, office, OpenShift administrator office hours, and we can get all your OpenShift vert questions answered because he's a virtualization expert too. So double bonus there. Awesome, Mike. Um, what else? Let's see. Gosh, we could talk for hours about all this stuff. What is like the hardest challenge that you feel in, in your daily job? Yeah, that's a that's a rough one. There's a lot of challenges, right? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that what we're what we're trying to do is um, make sure that we're not losing sight of the the forest and the trees, or however mm -hmm. this the saying goes. Um, you know, we, you want to make sure that we're moving towards not just containerization as a technology or, or Kubernetes, you know, those words are awesome, but right. at, at the end of the day, we want faster applications to market, right? We want, we want to solve some human problems that, you know, we were afraid to touch before because they looked too complex because the data sets were too different or the information APIs were, were too different. Mm. Now we have tools to make changes to very large things at a, at a faster pace. And, you know, sometimes because we work in regulated industries or we have compliance statements or because X, Y, Z, we put all these processes around it and we put all these conditions around it. And um, we, the hardest part of my job sometimes is making sure you can still satisfy those, those worlds that you live in just doing it beforehand during the creation and the architecture of the right. platform as you're standing it up, you're, you're fulfilling those needs. And then you're letting this magic world exist inside it, which doesn't necessarily have to trigger all those processes because the larger platform itself has already done that. And um, that's, that's probably a lot of work right there for me. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. And just, uh, there's many differing opinions within the Kubernetes community too, right? Like anytime you're submitting uh, a pull request, potentially, I imagine there's a lot of why behind the, the, the code that you're submitting. Um, sometimes because it is like, where did this bug come from? Right? Like how often do you see, not pushback, but just like delays or lag or anything like that? Or are, is our relationship pretty awesome? Well, I mean, we, we touched on it a little bit before. Um, sometimes the, the largest part of our ecosystem, our partnering ecosystem, our contributors to Kubernetes, they're extraordinarily focused on cloud providers mm -hmm. and, and yeah, running, running Kubernetes on a cloud provider. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's hard to get them to see the importance of you know, this crazy variable that you need when you're just using EMC storage and that would only happen on premises. Right. And um, so that type of um, back and forth will happen the most around those situations. Um, or there's this belief that, um, you know, because you're on a public cloud, you can get new virtual machines very easily. They're almost free right, to quickly. You, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that bleeds through a couple areas of Kubernetes and, you know, sometimes we'll request things because it is hard to get a new virtual machine. It is hard to get a new piece of equipment in, mm -hmm. in on premises. And so we'll want to change something to allow for that sort of lag time or, or that consideration. And, um, you know, you might get your hand smacked a couple of times as you're pushing that idea forward. Uh, yeah, but those are, happens. those are, yeah, those are, are some, some of the areas. Yeah. We definitely try to work with, not against always. Right. Like, but it is hard sometimes to realize, you know, from someone's point of view of, you know, I work at AWS, you know, I work on Kubernetes for AWS. It's hard to see that forest through the trees and, and I'm not picking at AWS. It could be Alibaba. It could be anybody, right? Like how does this help my company? 
Well, it doesn't, but it's, you know, in the Kubernetes community, it's always community over company. So you have to keep that in mind uh, as you're contributing to um, that. It's not just the, the company you work for. It's also the greater community of users. And that's what matters most to me, I feel like. Yeah, you bet. And then, you know, the other side, besides just being inside of Kubernetes, you know, everybody was running around all the KubeCons last year saying, you know, the most important part of Kubernetes isn't happening in slash Kubernetes anymore. It's happening mm -hmm. in CNCF and mm -hmm. all the projects that are sort of growing around Kubernetes. Um, and that's only because Kubernetes is extensible, right? You can yeah. have a custom resource definition and you can use the declarative management, that API service, and just tell it to do different things in your new project. And um, Red Hat had a big part of adding that sort of ability to customize Kubernetes to do that because we, we wanted to take the product faster in all these directions. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it makes sense to push back into Kubernetes core. And sometimes it makes sense to have something on top of Kubernetes, like right. Hey native or the logging solution or Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where you see us doing those things as well. Yeah. We're, we're opinionated to a point, right? Like we have a standard set of tooling that we could you know, run for you uh, through operators and everything else. Um, but if you want to plug in your own thing, that's fine too. That's the beauty of Kubernetes is, is, is its extensibility. That's a hard, like that's actually, is its extensibility is surprisingly hard to say. Um, <laughs> anyways, so Mike, it's been great having you on the show. I don't see any additional questions. Is there anything else you want to put out there for the world? No, we look forward to hearing the feedback on uh, 4.6. Like I said, it's coming out in October and uh, that'll be based on Kubernetes 119 for us. Awesome. Can't wait for it. So thank you very much, Mike. Great yeah. having you on. Look forward to having you back someday. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll be back here at uh, noon Eastern, 1600. Oh, wait, did I read that right? Yes, 1600 UTC uh, for OpenShift Commons. Ask me anything on, oh, wait for it, wait for it. API data protection. Oh, so that should be fun. Nice. API data protection is dope. All, All right. right. So Thanks. talk to you later, Mike. Yep. Bye. See you. Thank you.